Welcome to the Richard Nixon Presidential Library. I'm Jonathan Mavroidis with the Richard Nixon Foundation. Tonight we have a very special event. Uh, over the past year, we've launched a series in which we surveyed the landscape of U.S.-China relations. Uh, we launched a series in a, at an event last year featuring three very prominent people, um, U.S. Ambassadors, ambassadors who did work in China, Ambassador Stapleton Roy and Ambassador Carl Eikenberry, as well as journalist um, John, Prof, uh, John Pomfret, who has covered China. They talked about the current application of the Shanghai Communique, uh, the diplomatic document issued at the end of President Nixon's historic trip to China. We've had five more of these discussions, uh, including the triangular relationship between China and Russia, the so-called Thucydides trap, the North Korea nuclear issue, and the South China, China Sea. Today's topic is about President Xi Jinping, the leader of the People's Republic of China. He's been one of the most visible leaders in China, China has had in decades. He's also become, he also singularly has become a power player on the world stage and top, top of mind for leaders around the world in government, media, and public affairs, as well as top thought leaders around the world. Over the past year, President Trump has met President Xi at the Southern White House in Mar-a-Lago and during his own trip to China. And if you follow the President's tweets, he remains, continues to remain the top of the President's mind. Uh, just, to, just to show a few tweets, uh, just spoke to President Xi Jinping of China concerned the pro concerning the provocative actions of North Korea. Additional major sanctions will be imposed on North Korea today. This, issue, this situation will be handled, exclamation point. President Xi and I have always been friends. No matter what happens with our dispute on trade, China will take down its bar trade barriers because it's the right thing to do. Taxes will become reciprocal and a deal will be made on intellectual property. Great future for both countries. To talk about these issues, are two very distinguished panel, panelists uh, who are the foremost experts on the domestic political, political situation in China. Elizabeth Economy is the CV Star Senior Fellow and Director of Asia Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. She's an acclaimed author and expert on Chinese domestic policy and foreign policy, writing on topics ranging from China's environmental challenges to its resource quest. She has published numerous articles in foreign policy and scholarly journals, including Foreign Affairs, Harvard Business Review, Foreign Policy, New York Times, The Washington Post, and The Wall Street Journal. She is the author of By All Means Necessary, How China's, China's Resource Quest is Changing the World, the award-winning The River Runs Black, The Environmental Challenge of China's Future, and a new book called The Third Revolution, Xi Jinping and the New Chinese State, which will also be available for purchase in our museum store, and Dr. Economy will be uh, willing to meet you all and sign copies of it uh, in the Annenberg Court. This book analyzes the contradictory nature of reform under President uh, Xi and is becoming very, very influential. Jeffrey Wasserstrom is the Chancellor's Professor of History at the University of California, Irvine. His most recent book, co-authored with Maura Elizabeth Cunningham, is the third edition of China in the 21st century. What Everyone Needs to Know, published by Oxford in March. His other books include Eight Juxtapositions, China Through Imperfect Analogies from Mark Twain to Manchuko, Man Manchu Kuo, and is editor of the Oxford and is editor the Oxford Illustrated History of Modern China. An associate fellow of the Asia Society, he has served on the board of directors of the National Committee on United States United States China Relations. Is the editor of jur, jur, the Journal of Asia Studies, advising editor for Asia for the Los Angeles Review of Books, and a member of Dissent Magazine's editorial board. His commentaries and reviews have appeared in many general interest periodicals, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Financial Times. Times, Slate, The American Scholar, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, The Nation, and The Times Literary Supplement. Uh, this will be a discussion format, and I would like to start with the first question. Can you give us a brief overview of uh, each of you, how you both came to adopt China as a field of study? Uh, Elizabeth, why don't, we, why don't we start with you? Sure. Uh, thanks very much, Jonathan. It's really a pleasure to be here uh, at the Nixon Library. It's just a spectacular place. and. Uh, I was really privileged to spend a couple of hours with you uh, touring and really learning all about uh, President Nixon's legacy. Uh, really very impressive. Um, so uh, how did I get interested in China? Actually, I was a Soviet person back when there was still a Soviet Union. And uh, I studied in Leningrad, when it was still Leningrad, uh, in 1983. 
And um, it wasn't really until, and then I will say I went uh, to work at the CIA after I got my master's as the Gorbachev analyst. And then I went to get my PhD, and I thought it would be interesting to do comparative communism, actually, and to do China and the Soviet Union. And so I started studying China at that point, started my Chinese language training. Uh, and then, frankly, uh, by the time I finished, I did both my dissertation in both countries, but by the time I finished uh, my dissertation, uh, there was no more Soviet Union. It was Russia. Uh, there were no jobs. Nobody seemed to care that much about Russia at the time. Uh, and so I ended up um, working on China for the past almost 25 years now for my, my career. So uh, it, unlike many China scholars, probably like Jeff, um, I didn't begin with a deep love of Chinese culture or history. Uh, it really came out of the Soviet Union in, a, in, a tr in a, an effort to really understand this very different uh, set of political systems, you know, communist political systems. So, so my story is, is parallel and different. Um, I also didn't go into Chinese studies because of a deep sort of childhood love of Chinese culture. I love Chinese food. <laughs> and it is important that you love the food of a place you're going to go and do dissertation research because you have to eat a lot of it. Um, but I was interested in um, questions. I was interested in revolutions and I was interested in protest. And I was, um, I was torn. I, I started learning Chinese when I was in college at UC Santa Cruz because uh, they taught it, and I was just dabbling around in different history classes, and I took some Chinese history, and it was a really good class. Um, but I also took um, some French history and British history and things like that. And when I started to go to grad school, I thought I wouldn't be able to get a job when I got out with a history PhD. And so I thought, well, I'll study someplace. I'm interested in China. They have a lot of revolutions. They have a lot of protest. So why don't I focus on that? Uh, rather than France or England, and I'll have a better chance of getting a job, and I would tell people this, and they'd say, well, you're half smart. This was in 1982. They said, if you're really smart, you would have studied Japan, because they've got this booming economy that's going to buy and sell us. If you were really smart, study Japan, or study Russia, because they're our geopolitical rival, and so that's what people are going to do. So, um, my wife likes to say that I get the last laugh because China now is the economy that we fear as much as we did Japan then and the geopolitical rival as much as Russia was then. So it worked out okay. <laughs> Liz, the title of the book is called The Third Revolution. Uh, what is meant by the third revolution? Uh, what was the first and second revolution? Right. So. Um I think if you look back uh, to Xi Jinping's speech uh, in October of 2017 uh, at the 19th um, Party Congress, he says it best. You know, he delivered a three and a half hour marathon speech, and someplace in the middle he said, China has stood up, uh, grown rich, become strong, and is moving towards center stage. And, you know, the, the first revolution is Mao Zedong in 1949, and that's the period when China stood up. Uh, it stood up against uh, the Kuomintang, uh, the ruling party at the time. It stood up against foreign invaders. And Mao Zedong created the contemporary Chinese Communist Party state. Uh, the second revolution was Deng Xiaoping, and that's the period in which China got rich. Uh, and Deng Xiaoping called his period of reform and opening up the second revolution. Uh, and that was a period when uh, China introduced the market uh, into the Chinese economy, when civil society began to blossom. You had the establishment of non-governmental organizations. Uh, the internet uh, came into being. Um, you had uh, China welcome foreign influences, both in terms of ideas, but also foreign capital to help grow the Chinese economy. Uh, and you had Deng Xiaoping maintain a very low profile foreign policy. Uh, he wanted things to be stable in the external environment so that he could focus on growing the Chinese economy at home and uh, increasing the living standards of the Chinese people. Uh, and now, you know, as of 2012, uh, when Xi Jinping was first appointed uh, or selected as General Secretary of the Communist Party, uh, you have the Third Revolution. Uh, and that is the period, as Xi himself has described, where uh, China has become strong and is moving towards center stage. Uh, and in many respects, the Third Revolution is an upending uh, of Deng Xiaoping's Second Revolution. Uh, 
I don't know whether you want me to tell you everything that's in it. That's the whole book, but, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll stop there. Those are the first two revolutions. I kind of wanted to start with also with a background of President Xi. Um, many in this audience know who President Xi is. His media profile has significantly risen uh, due to President Trump's visit to China and Xi's visit to uh, the United States. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Trump has tweeted repeatedly about their positive relationship and everything from dealing with North Korea and trade. Um, could you, uh, Jeff, give us a background of President Xi and how he came to rise as President of the People's Republic of China? So one of the main things to know is that we don't know a lot about Xi Jinping, what really makes him tick. I mean, we know um, basic things about his biography. His father was um, a party elder. Um, his, his father was very important and had a lot of uh, stature within the People's Republic of China. His father was seen in the 1980s as on the more kind of reformist side of um, the, the power elite. So some people very foolishly, who really don't understand fathers and sons very well, I think, assumed that because the father had one set of political views that you could project what the son would be. And so there was a lot of speculation when Xi Jinping rose that he might be a reformer because as Nicholas Kristof put it, um, it was in his DNA, um, but that really isn't uh, how things work, and it isn't how it worked with Xi Jinping. So he was an official in um, different kinds of, like, people rise within um, the elite within China. He was described as a princeling in the sense of being the son of a powerful figure. So he's the first leader uh, since 1949 uh, to come at the root uh, toward power through family connections of that sort in part. Um, and there's a story now told about him. There's a lot about his youth and about his, um, his road to power. That's a very kind of hagiographic, prettified um, version of it that presents him as having been a man of the people who really interacted with ordinary people and showed his goodness and also showed um, various things. So we really don't know exactly. We know that he was well connected. We know that his family suffered during the Cultural Revolution, as enormous numbers of people did. And um, we know that he served in a variety of, of roles. We also know that he was connected to a variety of people in different parts of, um, of, the, of the party elite. But one of the enduring things about Chinese leaders in this system now is when an American um, candidate is running for president, they lay out a platform and they say what they'll do if they're elected, whether they live up to it or not. In China, you take, get the top spot and then you tell people what your platform was. So. I might just add one or two things. Yeah, I think, um, I think Jeff described very well. I guess um, one of the things that has struck me is that you know he lived um, in sort of two, of the, the poles of, of existence. So the first, as Jeff mentioned, you know, very privileged existence as one of the sons of the very top uh, leaders uh, in the country. Uh, his father was the head of propaganda and also a vice premier. Um, and he grew up in a, you know, very sheltered kind of enclave with other uh, princelings. Uh, but then during the Cultural Revolution, yeah, his family suffered a lot. His sister, we don't know she was killed. She maybe committed suicide. Uh, there are rumors that his mother denounced him. Um, his father was purged and jailed, and he was sent down to the countryside. Uh, and that's the other pole, right? And so, um, but from there, you know, I think one of the surprising things, or the things that continues to surprise me, uh, is that rather than turn him against the Communist Party, that period when he was sent down to the village, right? He was 15 years old. He, you know, had to stop his education, his formal education. Um, and yet he became only more determined to join the Communist Party. You know, some, some uh, figures put it at he applied 10 times uh, to become a member of the Communist Party before he was uh, finally accepted. That was because his father was considered to be, you know, politically incorrect at that uh, period of time. Um, but, but I think it, there's something in, in there about that determination and that commitment to the party that I think continues to inform him now. Um, and, and also, as he rose, one of the things that distinguished him from previous set of leaders, uh, Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao, is that he primarily served in the wealthy coastal areas. 
and he kind of rode along as these provinces developed very rapidly. There was never a sense that he drove economic reform, but he didn't also hinder it. But the one thing that he did talk about all the way up his rise was corruption. And I think when we talk about Xi Jinping's commitment to corruption, whether he uses it to attack his enemies or it's you know, genuinely something that he's committed to, I think it's, it's both. <laughs> Jeff maybe feels similarly. Um, but I think uh, that is the one issue that if you track him all the way through, he talks about how officials should not use positions for personal economic gain. You should not go into public service if what you're interested in is personal economic gain. Um, so I think it's just, you know, there, there's a few things that we have gleaned uh, from his rise up, but, but not very much. So uh, just to piggyback on Liz, that's great kind of analysis. Now I know more about Xi Jinping. <laughs> Uh, but what I would say is that people often think that when it comes to past leaders that somebody will either want to be like them or not want to be like them. And Mao was the most powerful leader that China's had since 1949. And so some will be the questioning, is Xi Jinping a new Mao? Does he want to be a new Mao? Or did different leaders reject Mao? Deng Xiaoping was seen as rejecting Mao. But actually what happens is leaders have complex legacies. They have different sides to them as actually being in the Nixon library, you become very clear that if you say as somebody like Nixon, you need to say, are we talking about foreign policy? Are we talking about domestic policy? Are we talking about style? Are we talking about something else? So with Mao, there are two things to keep in mind about Mao. He was very powerful and he thought there should be absolute loyalty to the party. He thought the party had saved China. Um, Xi Jinping, I think, relates to both of those things. He wants to be um, revered, um, they has something like a personality cult now. His book is being used something like Mao's writings were. But another thing about Mao was Mao thought that one thing that was good for China was to shake things up and to have mass movements happen because that would be good for China. And Xi Jinping doesn't want to have anything to do with that. I think partly because of the family experience and partly because he knows what uh, happened to the country then. So he both is attaching himself to part of Mao's legacy and Mao's style, but then utterly unlike it in, in other regards. And I think that's something that we can get from the history of this. Talking about President Xi's vision for China, um, you mentioned the, uh, the 19th Party Congress. Last October, the Communist Party of the People's Republic of China uh, held its 19th Party Congress. And it was reported that, among other things, that a new generation of senior leaders were selected and that Xi was elected to another five-year term effectively abolishing term limits and establishing for himself personal rule. Uh, this question has a few parts, but the, f the first question is, in a Chinese context, what is, what is meant by personal rule? And let's start with Liz. Um, so I, I think um, it, in terms of what Xi Jinping has done that's been striking for many of us, it has been that he has amassed an enormous amount of institutional authority. So, you know, he has uh, managed to, well, first use his anti-corruption campaign to target political competitors and opponents. Um, there was a study that was done by a professor up at Harvard that I, I don't think has been published yet, but basically it demonstrated that at the level of vice minister and above, which is, you would say, it's sort of a number two in a cabinet uh, level, you know, agency in the United States, uh, at that level and above, that um, uh, Forty percent of the people that have been arrested uh, under the anti-corruption campaign were in some way tied to a political faction uh, or senior leader that was a competitor to Xi Jinping. Uh, so we can see that some element of Xi's anti-corruption campaign has been used to target uh, political opponents. Uh, he's also managed to place himself at the top of a number of the most important commissions and committees that oversee broad areas of government policy. So if you look at cyber policy, if you look at um, economic reform and development, if you look at national security, Xi Jinping sits on top of all of them. Whereas in the Deng era, these positions would be a little bit more spread out among other members of the Standing Committee of the Politburo. So he sits at t on the top of, of again, sort of all of the things that sort of set the direction for the way that China's gonna go at home and, and abroad. Um, he's also, as you suggested, deinstitutionalized um, the system to some extent. So at the uh, 19th Party Congress in October, he failed to signal a successor. 
right? So everybody had anticipated that in, tw in 2022, uh, there would be a new leader of China, new general secretary of the Communist Party. I shouldn't say everybody anticipated. A lot of people didn't think it was going to happen, but it would have been the normal path. Um, but there, he did not uh, bring up a younger uh, member, a younger leader that would be a natural successor to him. So he signaled that he was probably going to stay for a third term. And then the big move that got all of the attention publicly uh, came this spring at the National People's Congress in March when they amended the Constitution, the party amended the Constitution uh, to eliminate the two-term limit for the presidency. Uh, and so that means that Xi Jinping can hold the position of general secretary, uh, the position of um, uh, basically the central military commission head, the head of the PLA, uh, and the presidency for at least three terms, if, if not more, uh, depending on whatever the party and he uh, agreed to moving forward. Uh, so I think when we think about uh, the personal power of Xi Jinping, I think in terms of the institutional authority, because what we don't know is how much personal loyalty he actually commands throughout the system. So those are two different things. When I was in Beijing in March, for example, I heard uh, that the senior leaders, the retired old senior leaders, people like uh, Jiang Zemin or Zhu Rongji, were very unhappy with the fact that they had eliminated the two terms uh, for the presidency. Uh, that uh, this was a marker, A, of, of avoiding the kind of chaos that Jeff was alluding to that took place under Mao Zedong. Uh, but B, it represented also China as a modern uh, power, as a country where it did have an institutionalized path to succession. Uh, and so they were very unhappy about that. And I think you can see lots of different pockets of discontent throughout society. So I, I would be wary of saying that he commands an enorm enormous amount of personal loyalty, although I think certain of his policies are broadly popular. In not naming a successor, do you think there'll ever be a succession plan? Do you ever anticipate there being an ex a succession plan? Well, I think there will be a succession plan, because if there weren't, that would also you know, portend a degree of chaos, which you know, I, I agree with Jeff. I think that is you know, not in Xi Jinping's DNA, that kind of chaos. Jeff, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I, agree, with, I, I agree with everything that was just said. I, the only thing I'd add is that in terms of personal rule, the other thing at a just kind of experiential level, if you go to China now, you cannot forget who the man in charge is. Uh, whereas under Hu Jintao, his immediate successor, you could spend time in China and not really have seen his face anywhere. You could walk into a bookstore, not see Hu Jintao's books. Now Xi Jinping's face is all over the place and um, he shows up on the front pages of newspapers much, much more often. Um, there is a kind of personal style of rule, which I think is something, it's, China is in step in some ways with some other places where we've also seen moves to more uh, personal rule in many kinds of places. This is an era of strongman leaders who um, are seen as representing the country in a way uh, that isn't always the case with leaders of modern nations, at least hasn't been in other times. Building on that a little bit, during the party congress, the CCP enshrined Xi's quote unquote thoughts in the constitution. We hear words like Chinese dream or socialism with Chinese characteristics or the four, four comprehensive or the four greats. Uh, what are we supposed to make of this sort of language, um, uh, President Xi's thoughts in, in the constitution? So the fact that it's in the constitution is probably the most important thing about it. That was something that, um, is redolent of Mao's period, that this is elevating somebody's thought to the level of sacred writ. And one of the things that happened was with speeches by, collected speeches of political leaders in the recent past in China, after Mao's Little Red Book was everywhere for a time and people associated with a time of uh, personality cult rule and bad things, um, the leader's words wouldn't be sanctified that way until after they'd stepped down or after they'd died. With Xi Jinping, it's happened while he's still been alive. That was already happening with the books and then the Constitution and now even uh, study centers for the analysis of Xi Jinping thought on campuses. It's all very, very um, disturbing. In terms of content, socialism with Chinese characteristics or Xi Jinping's version, it doesn't have a lot to do with what we usually think of with socialism. 
at least in the idea of a more equal distribution of wealth. China's not moving in that direction. It's more about the party in control and China getting stronger. Um, and it's about nationalism. Um, it's not really, though, about the content. It's more about an idea of getting everybody onto the same page in terms of following a, 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 an ideology again. Liz, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, no, I guess I would, I would just say that I think Xi Jinping is the first Chinese leader since Deng Xiaoping, though, to come in with a vision of some sort. And I think his vision is that Chinese dream or the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, which again goes back to the idea of moving China towards center stage and playing a larger role in terms of writing the rules of the game uh, when it comes to international relations, at least in part. Um, but I also think it means, you know, he wants a robust Chinese Communist Party um, that's at the forefront of the political system. Uh, again, if you look back at the anti-corruption campaign, I mean, he basically said, you know, in his first day in office that corruption, if not addressed, could mean the death of the uh, Communist Party and even the death of the Chinese state. And so I think, uh, you know, the corruption campaign has been, I think, the most robust that we've seen of any contemporary Chinese leader. You know, usually corruption campaigns, they sort of wax and they wane. You, you know, there's a little upsurge for a year, two, two years, whatever, and then they die down. Uh, but his has become stronger every single year. More Chinese officials have been arrested every year than the year before. Last year, I think it was 520-some thousand. Um, and now they're broadening the campaign to include not just Communist Party officials, but also um, you know, people who hold responsible positions in government institutions like hospitals and, and schools, educational institutions who aren't necessarily Communist Party members. Um, so I think that was another part of it. And I think um, another part of his great vision is, is transforming China from a manufacturing nation to an innovation nation. Uh, and we see that in lots of different ways in terms of the amount of money that China's pouring into research and development, in terms of the Made in China 2025 uh, program that many of you may have heard about. This is something that President Trump is targeting right now. This is a, a sort of an China's industri industrial policy, basically protecting 10 industries in critical, cutting-edge uh, technologies like artificial intelligence and robotics, um, new materials, uh, new energy vehicles, um, so to keep, uh, to basically to keep out foreign competition. Uh, and I think the last part is really having a stronger People's Liberation Army. You know, what he said very early on was he wants to have an army that is capable of fighting and winning wars. And he's moved very aggressively over his first five years to, um, to strengthen the army, both in terms of rooting out corruption and, um, and bringing in new people and professionalizing the army. He's uh, reorganized it and modeled it on the US system with theater commands. Um, I th and we've seen what he's been doing in the South China Sea. So I think, you know, in terms of the rhetoric, yeah, what does the four comprehensives really mean or socialism with Chinese characteristics, you know, for a new era? I don't think anybody knows, but I think the component parts of his vision, we can, we can understand what it is he's trying to do. One of the other items that came out of the 19th Party Congress was the extension of the Communist Party on more aspects of society. Uh, the conventional wisdom was that the Communist Party has already dominated Chinese society. Uh, how does this, how does Xi's vision change uh, the extension of the party. Uh, Jeff, why don't you take that first? So, um, yeah, I think it's important to not fall into the trap of thinking of the Communist Party as an unchanging entity. It's been an experimental entity throughout its um, time in power and even before it came to power. It's always kind of tinkering with different kinds of, of, of recipes. And I think the one other thing I would say, going back to the ideology is that part of the, some of the things that Xi Jinping is talking about and some of the symbolism related to him is striking a chord and is quite popular, and I think the anti-corruption campaign in particular. Even if you would talk to people in China and say, but doesn't it seem to be selectively targeting people who are linked to Xi, uh, one reaction will be, but there is so much corruption out there, at least some of the bastards are um, having to suffer. So there are certain things that tap into something. I think there's also a lot of aspiration for a stronger country and things like that. But one of the things the Communist Party has been dealing with um, for a couple of decades now, or more than a couple of decades, since 1989, 
is a sense that they were sort of losing out, um, that, that a younger generation was not identifying with them. And the party has been trying to figure out ways to get um, younger people more re-engaged with it. There's, um, they're reaching out, they've become much more um, active in propaganda within the country as well as outside of the country. And there was a tendency, so that's to try to get more people into the party and feel a part of it and believe in it, or at least, and to have it sort of, um, even if it's just belief in it as a kind of party that represents nationalism, to feel attached to it and to identify China's rise with what it's doing. Um, but there are also other ways in which, uh, from, the mid from the early 1990s, after this crackdown, after 1989, um, life became very controlled in China um, briefly. But then, in part to try to not have another kind of struggle like 1989, 1989 people had wanted political change, but they had also just wanted the party to be less invasive in their life. A lot of reasons why students protested in 89 was they felt that the government was micromanaging things like what music they could listen to, who they could date, how their um, sex lives went, and things like that. And they wanted the, the party to back off. And in the 1990s, mid-1990s, early 2000s, there was a sense in which if you went from China from year to year, thing, the party was a little bit less present. The state was a little bit less present. There was more choice. You could basically, if you were a young person in China, you could listen to most of the same music that people in other parts of the world were. You could watch more movies. You could have more forms of entertainment and things like that. And the party seemed to have come up with this thing, a deal of sorts. Both will, will improve your quality, your standard of living, and just let us stay in control. And also, we'll give you more choices in all the aspects of your life other than the political ones. And that seemed to kind of be working, but in some ways, the party, not just under Xi, it started a few years before Xi Jinping came up, felt in part more self-confident about trying to um, try to control people again in different ways. So there's a sense now when you go to China from year to year, you don't feel that there are less areas that the party's trying to control, but more. And this can take different forms in different parts of the People's Republic of China. The most extreme form of it, and where there really is very little space for these kind of uh, individual freedom as well, and where you can't forget the party's um, presence and control, are places like Tibet, um, and in particular these days, Xinjiang, where there are um, largely non-Han ethnic uh, minority groups, and mm -hmm. the state's presence and the party's presence is intense. In Xinjiang, there are now large, um, a massive network of re-education camps of a sort that had disappeared from China, but are now back where people are disappearing into them and be having very intense kind of efforts to indoctrinate them in the party's beliefs. And there also are there's very bizarre kinds of forms of this. At one point in um, Uyghur areas where a lot of people are religiously Muslims, there would be members of the party that would go into their homes to spend time to try to expose them to the right um, way of thinking in the party. There would be these individual visits. That's a kind of intrusiveness of the party that maybe you associate with dystopian fiction, but it really had stopped being um, the pattern in, um, in the People's Republic of China in the 1990s and early 2000s. It also had stopped to a certain extent in the 1980s. There was a liberalization then. So there really is a way in which this intrusiveness is a big part of the story, not just under Xi, because it started before then, but of the kind of uh, roughly last 10 years. Do you think anything to add to that? Yeah, uh, just just quickly, I guess um, I think uh, you know two other ways that I, I think the party has reasserted itself into society and the economy would be um, one, which is sort of the surveillance system, uh, cameras that you know do uh, have artificial intelligence, you know, facial recognition. Uh, they are trying to do voice recognition so that they can listen in on a phone call and be able to identify the two people that are speaking. Mm -hmm. Um, there's this new system, I'm sure many of you have read about it, the uh, sort of social credit uh, system where uh, you'll be evaluated uh, on a set of metrics. It's not clear exactly what they're going to be. There are a number of pilot programs uh, out there right now, but by 2020 they want to un unroll a, um, uh, 
a nationwide program, but it can include things like, did you default on a loan, or uh, did you participate in a protest, uh, were your, did your friends behave badly, did you jaywalk, um, and the information will be gathered through, you know, apps that you use on your phone, um, you know, if you're doing, using, you know, Ant Financial Pay, whatever, or uh, it could be that your neighbor is reporting on you. That's the kind of thing that used to happen, you know, mm -hmm. back during the Maoist period where you'd have neighborhood committees that would be in your business on all sorts of different issues. Um, so you'll get a social credit score and that will determine a system of rewards and, and punishments. You know, can you fly in a plane or take a high-speed rail? You know, can you get first in line for a, a new fancy restaurant? Whatever it is. So it's a, it's a, a new way that the party um, has reinserted uh, itself in a very micro way uh, into the lives of the Chinese people. Uh, and in terms of the uh, economy, I think one of the things that has surprised many people, certainly uh, people uh, in New York where I live, in the financial community, is that they thought that Xi Jinping would be an economic reformer. So there were the people <laughs> uh, who were, as, as Jeff suggested, thinking that Xi Jinping might be a political reformer because of his father. Uh, but there were also a lot of people uh, who thought that Xi Jinping would be a significant economic reformer because uh, in October of 2000, November of 2013, the party put out this big economic reform agenda. Uh, and in the agenda, it said that the market would be a decisive force. But it also said that the state would continue to play a commanding role, but the people ignored that part of the, the, uh, the program and focused only on the market as a decisive, uh, would play a decisive role. But what we've seen since then, in fact, is that Xi Jinping very much likes to keep his fingers on the levers of economic control. So if you look now, you'll see that uh, there is a push uh, to enhance the role of party committees uh, in not only state-owned enterprises, but in private enterprises in China and in, in joint ventures. And so in the research for my book, for example, I talked to some of the uh, people who work for multinationals and they're saying that they're trying now to rewrite the rules of corporate governance to say things like the chairman of the person of the party committee. And I should say, party committees are just made up of party members in a particular company. And typically a party committee might, you know, Xi Jinping would give a speech, and you'd read the speech, you'd talk about the speech, you'd meet once a week or once a month, depending on how active uh, a party committee it might be. you get guidance from the top. Maybe you'd have a tree planting campaign, you'd take the lead on that. But uh, generally speaking, they were not terribly robust entities, uh, and certainly not in a joint venture. Um, but, but now they're saying the chairman of this party committee should be the chairman of the board or the party committees have started to try to tell these firms where they should be investing, right? Because the state has certain interests. Maybe the state wants to develop a certain province of China, a certain city. Uh, so they can use state-owned enterprises for that, but certainly they couldn't use joint ventures or even private enterprises. But now Xi Jinping is trying to push the role of these party committees to play a much larger role uh, in terms of the actual economic decision-making of these firms. So that's another, I think, fairly important way in which the party is reinserting itself uh, into a broader society and the economy today. In this context, how do you square the, pers the perspective of dynamic change, building the middle class, building, uh, modernizing Chinese institutions with the elevation of Xi's uh, personal rule and the extension of party uh, control? Uh, Jeff, you want to start with that one? So the, the rising middle class and things uh, with this, that, I mean, I think this is so, there are lots of contradictions about China um, now and things that you have to make room in your head for two what seem to be quite different kinds of, uh, of trends. Um, and Xi Jinping will play to both of them in different settings and certainly um, you know, in Davos, he talked about China's openness to the world, and he talks, uh, he gets seen to some extent as um, a global, somebody uh, friendly towards some kinds of globalization, um, in part because of things he does, in part just because of things he doesn't do, like he hasn't pulled out of the Paris Accords. And he benefits from the American turn inward simply by standing still and not um, seeming to turn, uh, turn inward. But there have been contra there are contradictions with him between 
both being interested in being more active in the world and talking about wanting to have a tougher line about stopping pernicious Western influences from flowing into China. That's a kind of contradiction. Um, not wanting Western ideas to be taught on Chinese campuses, but sending his daughter to Harvard and having lots of students coming abroad in different ways. So I guess an ideal scenario, I mean, some of this, the, the, the models for how this has worked um, in some other communist states in the past probably doesn't really work because you don't have this large, we don't have the example of the large middle class. But if we get out of thinking of what a model might be or what models might have been for the Communist Party, and we don't think about just Communist Party places, there are places with um, fairly strong one-party rule, a lot of control of speech and dissent, and not much protest, and very modern kind of economy, a very large middle class, and a mix of traditional values and um, strongman rule, and that was true in Singapore for a long time, and Chinese leaders have been very interested in Singapore for a while, and we saw during the coverage of the Singapore summit that actually Kim Jong-un seems to be interested in Singapore. Can I have that? <laughs> Can I have a place with, you know, glittering modernity, but also nothing out of the ordinary happens, or, you know, that the, the state doesn't control, and for a long time, um, Lee was in charge, and the Lee family still is in much of charge, that there is a kind of um, elevation of the personal loyalty. There's traditional values plus modernity. There's um, limits and things like that. William Gibson, the science fiction uh, writer, and these days science fiction writers are good to turn to for uh, political insight, once called Singapore Disneyland with the death penalty. And I think, you know, a style of this, a very modern place with a lot of the attractions of living in an enjoyable life, but at the same time, a high degree of control. I think that's part of the model for the Chinese Communist Party now on a, on a massive scale. Liz? No, I, I would agree. I'm not quite sure, you know, it's reasonable for a country of 1.3 billion people to think that they can achieve what a, you know, city-state you know, of how many people, three million is it, um, uh, has, has attained. Um, but I agree that that That's is great. a model yeah. that, that, they, uh, that they like. You know, I think if you look back to 2010, 2011, if we're talking about a rising middle class, I think uh, began to see a Chinese middle class that in many respects resembled middle classes everywhere, uh, that as the Chinese people were becoming wealthier, uh, they were demanding the same kinds of things that middle classes demand everywhere, which is to say they wanted clean air, uh, they wanted good education for their children, uh, they wanted the opportunity to play a larger role in the political decision-making process. And so the internet, for example, was a very vibrant political space. Uh, you had people conducting polls, calling for environmental change, calling for political reform. And so while there's sometimes a sense that uh, this sense of exceptionalism with China, or you know, China's gonna be the place that does it differently, it's the only you know, large economy in the world that's not a democracy. I think sometimes you know, we need to remember that many Chinese people have the same sorts of demands and interests uh, that we see everywhere. Uh, and I think you can see that even today with the feminist movement in China or the LGBTQ movement in China. All of these things are burbling up in the country and using the internet, even though the internet is far more constrained, uh, to keep pushing. And even when the government tries to push them down, they push back. Uh, so I, you know, I think things are different. And I think Xi Jinping wants a different model. <clears throat> But I also think that he's, he will be continually pressed by a, a middle class and others who want what other places also have. Liz, in the Third Revolution, um, moving on to economic issues, in the Third Revolution, you addressed some of China's future economic challenges uh, with an aging population, uh, pension shortfalls, uh, demand for higher wages. Uh, how is she prepared um, to deal with the challenge of economic reform? Well, I think, um, you know, he set out in um, March of this year 
sort of three priorities. One was deleveraging the economy, basically because China has amassed uh, an enormous amount of debt in a very short period of time, particularly corporate debt, um, but also household debt is rising, um, and even government debt is, is relatively flat. Uh, but the IMF identified uh, this rapidly rising debt as a serious concern for China and said that um, other countries, all other countries, uh, that have experienced this rate of rapidly rising debt have ended in financial crisis. So for Xi Jinping, deleveraging uh, the economy, so basically, you know, stopping the spigot of, of credit uh, and reducing the levels of debt is, is one top priority. A second is addressing the environmental challenge. Um, and they've pushed very hard on the issue of air pollution over the past several years, and they have a water pollution and a soil contamination uh, plan. Um, the, how well they've done in terms of air pollution is, is a somewhat complex um, issue. Suffice it to say that some areas have improved significantly and others have deteriorated and they are exporting pollution as well. So that's a, that's a, quick, a quick summary of that. Um, and then finally there's poverty alleviation. And I think, you know, frankly even I uh, tend to forget that still 40% of the Chinese population lives on uh, less than $5.50 uh, per day. Uh, you know, we tend to think of China as this, it has a massive economy, of course, but also has 1.3 billion people, and it has, you know, a huge number of billionaires, but also very significant uh, uh, portion of the population that still lives in relative poverty. And that's the third thing that he wants to do. All of these are, to some extent, issues of legitimacy uh, at this point, and um, so he needs to tackle them. You pointed out a number of other issues looking ahead, demographic issues. You know, China is a country where they're expecting that, uh, you know, 30% of the population is going to be 65 or older by 2050. Uh, their population that's zero to 24, zero, ages zero to 24, uh, hit its peak in 2012 and has been uh, decreasing ever since. Um, so they're concerned uh, about the demographic challenge. They have huge pension shortfalls that they're facing. They don't have enough old age homes. Societal norms have shifted so that, you know, young people are not always living with their parents and able to take care of them. A couple of years ago, they passed, uh, I don't know that they passed a law, but at least they put in place a regulation that said that uh, children had to visit their parents at least once a year because they had stopped doing that. Um, you know, striking in a society, just a, but a, just a kind of sign of the shift in, in social mores. Um, so I think there are many, many different uh, economic challenges that Xi Jinping faces. Um, you know, there's a whole industry that exists in the world in which, you know, Jeff and I operate, the China-watching world uh, that basically sits and tries to bet on how long China can sustain, you know, this, what it's been doing. People have predicted that it's going to fail for, you know, two decades probably at this point. Um, somehow they still manage to, to tweak things here and there to keep it going. Um, but I think they're quite concerned at this point. Jeff, what about you? Can President Xi effectively navigate the challenges of economic reform? So I guess the other thing about there's the, the China watching community, but there's also the Chinese Communist Party itself is an incredibly diagnostic organization. They have think tanks. They're trying to look at all the scenarios where things haven't worked. They're really studying very hard how different things work and are quite open to adjusting these kind of formulas. Now, it's very hard. At some point, the Chinese Communist Party will fall. You can quote me on that. I just won't say what decade or which century, <laughs> because all political systems eventually do change. But the idea that there's a specific moment when it will happen because of X, the X's keep the, the party spends a lot of energy trying to alter that equation. They study a lot of things, organizations like them that have fallen, economies that have been like them that have reached a point where they've had trouble. So anything that we're thinking about in Western social science, they would be thinking about those things in China as well. There's a whole industry in China based on figuring out how not to go the route of the Soviet Union. A lot of energy was put into that. Um, there's a lot of energy into trying to figure out how a rising middle class won't necessarily lead to democratization the way it did in South Korea or other places like that. So it can't go on forever, but yet there does seem to be a lot of ability to keep it going on, in part 
Um, Liz very correctly mentioned the sort of exporting of issues. You can export pollution. You can also export, or you can put off economic problems at home with things like infrastructure projects that go beyond China's borders through this Belt and Road Initiative. So all of those things, it makes it hard because we haven't seen a country of this size with these kinds of ambitions go through that in a way to try to see will that put off the crisis. So there are all kinds of structural problems that could cause enormous um, problems. And I think Liz is absolutely right to say we should always remember that people in China have many of the same kinds of aspirations. Um, it isn't like there's missing a desire for more control over their life or more um, political choices. There's nothing about Chinese culture that doesn't fit with democracy. We can tell by the way Taiwan became a very vibrant democracy while being as much kind of uh, many sort of things we think of as Chinese traditional values were alive there as much as in China, in some cases more so. Um, we see in Hong Kong uh, that's now part of the People's Republic of China, there's still a desire, very kind of daring moves that people make to try to protect the things that allow for more, more freedom there. So it's not that there, the, there are people there who are um, all willing to be um, controlled in this way. It's just a very complicated balancing act. And I think one of the things that um, to watch for is are there ways that things happen in China that interfere with what people feel has been getting better in their life. I think that's why the pollution issue was so um, such a cutting edge one for the Communist Party because the story they'd been telling people to l legitimate themselves was under us, life is getting better. You're living a lot better than your parents' and grandparents' generation did. But if the horrible smog was getting there, people might say, well, yeah, I can buy more stuff, but I'm actually not living better, and my children won't live better because of, of that. So there's been, that, that's where a place where there are pushbacks, and there are often also pushbacks, and I think it's really good to bring up um, the feminist movement against tall odds. People are working very hard at that, LGBTQ. Um, but there are also other kinds of things, even under the radar, there have been recently been protests by, um, by veterans um, feeling that they're not being treated fairly. There are a lot of things where um, there is a lot of energy for people when they feel that they're being treated unfairly, that they'll take action within the confines they can. Uh, moving on to the United States and China, um, so we're gonna start off talking about China's foreign policy ambitions, at least in Xi's China. Uh, does he intend on maintaining uh, as a policy regional hegemony or do his aspirations as a global power creep into uh, the military sphere? And I think there's some examples that we can talk about, um, uh, South, the South China Sea, uh, Taiwan, and in particular, the effect on U.S.-China relations. You want to take Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. So um, I think- You are um, the Council on Foreign Relations. I am the Council uh, on Foreign Relations, <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to talk about Chinese foreign policy. Um, I think, so, so, Certainly China is not the regional hegemon right now. Does it aspire to regional hegemony? I would say yes. Would it like to see the United States pushed out of the region? Uh, yes, over time. Um, but I think more broadly, uh, what we see uh, in terms of Xi's foreign policy is pretty significant uh, shift in three different areas. Uh, one is, as you suggest, um, the sort of Taiwan um, and South China Sea. I think and even Hong Kong, I would say. I think this falls broadly into Xi's efforts to move from staking claims around issues of sovereignty to realizing them. So, you know, he has called for China to be reunified by 2049. And these are the three areas, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau, and the South China Sea, uh, where things are not exactly as he would like. <laughs> So he is moving in different ways, uh, sometimes militarily, sometimes through coercive economic and political efforts, as in Hong Kong and Taiwan, um, and sometimes in inducements uh, with Taiwan as well, uh, to try to uh, bring all of these areas uh, under Chinese, mainland Chinese uh, control. Uh, so I think that's one area. I think the second is what Jeff mentioned, which is the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and that really is, you know, a grand scale plan uh, for, first for infrastructure connectivity uh, from China through to 
about 68 other countries, although by now, frankly, all countries in the world are welcome to, to be part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, so it began that way in 2013 and 2014, right, as infrastructure, but um, it has morphed and evolved uh, to include things like a digital Belt and Road. Uh, so China wants to um, uh, basically map out the uh, satellite systems, e-commerce, and fiber optic cables uh, that will spread throughout uh, from China through the rest of Asia and Middle East and Europe and out to Africa. Um, there's a polar ice belt uh, to connect China through to Europe uh, in a shorter, faster way. Uh, there's a security component to the Belt and Road. So China now controls 76 uh, ports in 35 countries. That's my last count of a couple of months ago. Um, but, you know, they say this is for commercial purposes, but in fact, in a number of instances, PLA Navy ships have stopped, or submarines have stopped by to visit some of these ports. Uh, and I would argue that there's a political component, and um, not everybody agrees with me on this, that China's exporting at, at least elements of a political model. It's not like many Chinese communist parties. This is not Mao. They're not trying to foment communist revolution globally. Uh, but I do think that there is an effort uh, underway to promote uh, some degree of authoritarianism. So they are, uh, officials in China are at least in eight African countries, and not just Sudan and South Sudan, but also Namibia and Kenya, uh, working to help officials there uh, figure out how to do propaganda, uh, how to maintain political stability, how to control populations, uh, pushing forward on internet sovereignty, uh, exporting China's surveillance system uh, to Pakistan and to other countries. Uh, so I think that all of this has become part of a, a larger effort um, by the Chinese government to uh, influence uh, development globally. I mean, there are other um, sort of impetuses for Belt and Road too, of course, so part of it has to do with wanting to connect some of the lesser developed regions of China to the rest of the world. Uh, part of it has to do with looking to export overcapacity, areas like coal-fired power plants and steel and, you know, what the industries that China used to develop its economy domestically for the past several decades, now they have too much of it, right? So let's export that abroad and we can be responsible for uh, developing, you know, all the infrastructure, right? So if you look at all the infrastructure projects, 89% of them are being done by Chinese firms. Right, 89% of the labor uh, is our Chinese labor uh, that, that are doing these projects, which is a source of some concern in many of these countries because they're not realizing all the benefits of the Chinese investment and lending. And there are many problems with the Belt and Road, and we can talk about them if, if you're interested, um, but this is a big, big signature effort that, if successful, I think has the potential to really reshape the geopolitical, strategic, and economic landscape of the world. Because if, if you think about it, right, if China, if Chinese companies are doing fiber optic cable, satellite systems, and e-commerce, these are the standards, they're setting the standards for the next 50 to 100 years, right? It's Chinese rail gauge, it's Chinese fiber optic cables, et cetera. And then finally, I think the third area, and maybe the one that is least, uh, least studied, or less attention is paid to it, is, is China in areas of global governance. So the extent to which China is trying to bring its own values and priorities and policies uh, into the international system, right? Changing rules and in, uh, international institutions and norms. Um, you know, maybe in the United Nations Human Rights Commission, for example, trying to get Chinese language in there uh, that would make them less susceptible to criticism or putting forward ideas of, of internet sovereignty, right? U.S. argues for the free flow of information. China argues for uh, an internet uh, that is much more tightly controlled by the home country, where the country determines what comes in and what goes out. So those are, I think, three big areas where China, under Xi Jinping, has pushed forward in pretty significant um, and, to some extent, uh, new ways. Very ambitious. Uh, foreign policy, the opposite of the Deng type low profile foreign policy. Jeff, do you have any thoughts on President Xi's foreign policy? That's very well put. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to trade relations, um, President Xi is quoted saying yesterday in response to the Trump administration's planned $50 billion in tariffs that, quote, in our culture, we punch back. 
is she's China prepared to retaliate to the Trump administration's actions? Jeff, I'll start with you. So I think all this stuff in our culture, we do X, in your culture, we do Y, that, that doesn't, that just gets us nowhere. There are all kinds of misapprehensions about um, Chinese culture and about, in China, about Western culture. Um, cultures have different strands. Um, there was something, so Xi Jinping's whole comment was in, or that was quoted was something like, in your culture, you turn the other cheek, but in my culture, we punch back. Well, somebody on Twitter, Devin Stewart, um, who's uh, uh, in a, at the Carnegie Foundation, she said, well, wait a minute. In the Western culture, there's also an eye for an eye. I mean, there are all kinds of things. And in Chinese culture, you can find things about others. Um, one misapprehension is that, that some people say in China, personal connections are really important. This thing called guanxi, that, you know, connections. Now, they are very important in China, but connections are very, very important within America for getting ahead as well, as people know. So I think it mystifies things to get too much into culture. Um, I think what, in a way, Xi Jinping was really saying was projecting at home an image of being a tough guy. And as much that, you know, China will stand up for itself. And if you push us, we'll push back. There's a lot of difference between Xi Jinping and Trump. Xi Jinping doesn't fly off the rails and say erratic things and things like that. And he doesn't offend traditional allies, necessarily, and things like that. But in this way, there are certain things where they're quite similar. They're talking about being tough, making sure their country gets a good deal and doesn't get taken advantage of. They also both tend to say, at some imagined point in the past, we were better off and I'm going to get you back to that kind of thing. The make America great again here, there's Xi Jinping's dream is very much about making China great again. He's reaching back further into the past. Even the Belt and Road Initiative is wrapped up in this idea of a distant past with a silk road. And it's always mystified, both in this country and that one, what part of the past you're talking about or what the past was really like. The actual Silk Road was about flows to and from China and China being as influenced by cultural things coming in from outside. The Belt and Road Initiative is talking about China projecting out its mode of doing things. So I think that just all gets in the way. But we have people, both people, who are going to be trying very hard to prove to a domestic constituency that they are not going to let their country be taken advantage of. And this is very um, worrying because I think in both cases, there's a lot at stake in um, not being seen as backing down too early. So it's gonna be um, a rocky time. Liz, how far will, the, will uh, she uh, go in terms of retaliation against uh, the Trump, administra Trump administration's tariffs? Oh, I think President Xi has made it quite clear at each um, stage of uh, the threat with tariffs that he will respond. Um, it's just tit for tat, just in a commensurate way. So he doesn't ratchet up the amount of tariff, he responds exactly at it. So it's 50 billion is the first round, 34 billion to start on July 6th. Xi Jinping is doing the exact same thing, 34 billion to start on July 6th, with another 16 to billion to come in a, in a second round. So I think he's, you know, keeping it, you know, at a very sort of, you know, just, as I said, commensurate with whatever President Trump is putting forward. I do think the Chinese uh, have been quite confused uh, about uh, President Trump's um, moves in this regard um, because I think they believed that they were in the midst of negotiations, that our two countries were negotiating <laughs> over trade, uh, and then President Trump, uh, you know, broke off the negotiations in a certain way and threatened another round of tariffs. The Chinese had stepped forward with an offer of, you know, to help reduce the trade, bilateral trade deficit by $70 billion. They put out their, you know, plans for reducing uh, tariffs on autos and said we're going to open up these sectors and lift restrictions on foreign bank ownership, et cetera. So they made up all these, you know, various policies. They thought this was a process, uh, but then, you know, I think President Trump um, and I, I don't know what's going on in the behind-the-scenes negotiations, uh, what more we might have been pushing for, um, but clearly uh, our side was not satisfied uh, with what they were getting from the Chinese, and so President Trump has pushed forward with this 
threat of sanctions, ever more sanctions. Uh, and I think, um, you know, I haven't heard of any negotiations going on right now, so I'm a little bit concerned. I'm still somewhat optimistic that in the next, you know, week and a half, we could come to some resolution. But um, <laughs> uh, honestly, I, I don't know. Final question, which I'll uh, strike on a more optimistic tone, and then we'll get to uh, uh, audience Q&A. How can the U.S. and China, under current circumstances, uh, President Xi, President Trump, uh, attain a constructive relationship in the economic and strategic spheres? I'll start with you, Liz. Um, so I think uh, one of the things that's happened in the past few months, uh, in particular in Washington, has been a sense that uh, the United States has gotten it all wrong, uh, that we uh, engaged with China for the past uh, several decades. Um, you know, we welcomed China into the World Trade Organization, and that somehow uh, we've been disadvantaged by this process all along the way, and, um, and now China has come out ahead, and uh, all of that engagement was for naught, right? We believed that we were modeling best behavior, that China was going to follow in our footsteps, uh, and they didn't follow in our footsteps. Uh, so there's this sense of great disillusionment uh, in Washington, uh, and I think that's contributed to a much tougher line on a, a whole range of issues, and very little interest in many parts of the government in working together. Um, I do think that some elements of a tougher policy are correct. Uh, I do think that the Chinese have had a tendency to promise and promise, promise, in particular in the trade and investment realm, and, and not actually deliver on much of those promises. Um, so I, I'm not opposed to using tariffs, for example, as a threat to get to the table to negotiate, but, but not probably as far as we seem to be going. Um, but I also think that we need to be focused on finding areas of common ground. You know, in the same way that the Obama administration did with climate change, working with China on climate change, uh, we should identify a new set of areas where uh, even as the relationship can be problematic on a number of fronts, we still have uh, agencies and people working together uh, to provide a floor uh, below which the relationship will not spiral down. So, for example, uh, we could be thinking uh, about working with China on, on things related to the Belt and Road. So, as I mentioned, there are a lot of problems with Belt and Road Initiative in terms of China's environmental standards, its overall governance, the transparency in the bidding, the way that it does the export of its labor. Um, so, many problems around it. We could work with others to try to uh, ratchet up Chinese standards, which would also uh, advantage U.S. companies um, over the long term. Uh, so, I think that's one important thing, in particular because the two foundational pillars of the relationship, things that have bolstered the relationship when it has been fraught, namely civil society and the business communities in both countries, those relationships are both on shaky ground right now. And frankly, not because of what we've done. This is, this, this part of it I, I lay at the feet of Xi Jinping. Um, but so I think it's really important for us to try to find uh, areas of, of common ground. Jeff? I, I just say that going forward in general, we should guard against this kind of tendency toward either romanticization of imagining that China is just on the verge of converting to our ways, whether that was religion in the old days or democracy or free market economy. We should just strip away that kind of romanticization and also try to guard against um, the alternative, which is kind of a demonization, which can blur into thinking that the Chinese are somehow uh, evil and threatening rather than saying there are certain things going on by the government that we disagree with. So we have to reclaim an ability of sort of clear-eyed engagement without um, overstated hopes, but also to, some, to recapture, in fact, the idea that there are fundamental differences and we should be able to express those. Uh, so I think it was a real mistake when we in past uh, summits, presidents have gone over from the United States and have insisted that at a press conference there be at least one question from uh, the press. And the press, it's often been a kind of show, but it's an important show. It says something about this is something in a negotiation that we have to have. And with Trump's visit, there was no 
question from the press. And I think that was the wrong kind of thing. And I think showering Xi Jinping with praise over the top on everything except trade, and then switching to vilifying him when it comes to trade is exactly wrong. It gives, Trump, it gives Xi Jinping exactly what he wants to be able to say at home. See how respected I am by the world's um, leading power, and also see how the world's leading power doesn't treat us fairly. So just a more dispassionate way of interacting with the head of a state who uh, does a lot of things that, um, that don't fit in with the American ideals of doing things would be a much better way uh, to deal with it. And I think in the long run, that's a, a stabler way for heads of state to interact when they've got fundamental um, tensions between the places. Um, our panel has agreed to answer your questions, but I first wanted to announce again that the Third Revolution <laughs> is available for purchase in the museum store. Thank and uh, <laughs> and uh, Elizabeth will uh, sign your copies. Uh, do we have any questions? <laughs> On my way. <laughs> so, President Trump has met with Kim Jong-un and Kim Jong-un has met with the president of South Korea. And all we hear on the news is that Kim Jong-un has been taking the train into China on numerous occasions to talk to Xi. What do you think they are talking about when he takes the train to China? <laughs> okay, so um, when I was in um, Beijing in March, as I mentioned, it, it was actually a really interesting point in time because it was right after um, President Trump had announced, uh, had threatened the first round of $50 billion in tariffs. It was right after he had signed into law the Taiwan Travel Act, which raised, uh, which basically supports high level visits between Taiwanese officials and American officials. And it was right after he had announced that uh, he was going to meet with Kim Jong un. And the Chinese were shocked. So I was meeting with, I was part of a delegation, we were meeting with um, think tank people and some officials. They were shocked. Uh, that President Trump was going to meet with Kim Jong-un. They were like, so you have to hold the meeting in Beijing or nothing good is going to come of this summit, right? So they were very concerned about being marginalized uh, at the outset. Uh, and, you know, President Xi moved very quickly to meet with Kim Jong-un after that announcement. It was the first time that they'd ever met. You know, in five years in office, uh, President Xi had never met with Kim Jong-un. Uh, and they've met three times, uh, you know, in, in total. What I think uh, they're saying, I think they're saying a couple of things. First, I think um, President Xi was unhappy that Kim Jong-un's initial gambit uh, was uh, to say, we will freeze our uh, testing and, and not to ask for a freeze in the military exercises. Uh, because the Chinese proposal had always been for a freeze for freeze. Right? that the U.S. and South Korea would freeze their military exercises and the North Koreans would freeze their testing. But Kim Jong-un just went out there and gave up the, the freeze on the testing without getting what China wanted, which was the freeze on the other side for the military exercises. So I think number one uh, was that he, the Chinese said, you need to get that back on the table. And you saw in that second round that Kim Jong-un came back and said, I want you know, I'm very unhappy about these military exercises right after he visited with Xi Jinping. Now, many people attributed that switch to Bolton's comment about the Libya model. It could have been related to that as well, but I feel reasonably confident that Xi Jinping also has been pushing for that. I think as well there are discussions about uh, economic opening up, uh, and the Chinese very quickly after the Trump and uh, Kim summit uh, said that they believe that the sanctions ought to be reduced, right? So like, as with the Russians, um, they said, let's, let's lift a little bit here, right? Ease up on the sanctions, on the economic sanctions a little bit. Uh, so, you know, for, from the Chinese perspective, President Trump gave them an enormous gift uh, at the summit, right? At the Singapore summit. He gave up the military exercises and he lofted the idea of the overall withdrawal of U.S. troops from the Korean Peninsula. So it's exactly what the Chinese have wanted. Uh, so I think uh, from right now, despite the fact that I think they still recognize they're dealing with two actors that are wildly unpredictable, so they can't just sit back, uh, I think they feel as though they're in a in pretty good state in terms of where things are sitting. Right here in the center. Thank you very much. Thanks for your analogies today. Much appreciated.
I'm Dr. Dana Churchill from the Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting. We've been working in China since about 2006 to stop the illegal organ harvesting of the Falun Gong. Many of you may have heard about the Falun Gong. We have quite good information now that the last report, the original researchers put together, says they basically killed 60 to 100,000 Falun Gong since 2000 every year for their organs. Okay, this, you didn't talk about Falun Gong at all. You mentioned the Uyghurs, which is good, but the Uyghurs actually have been organ harvested as well, as well as Christians and Tibetans. Can you comment on this, please? Um, all, I would, all I would comment on with, with, with Falun Gong is that the reason why the crackdown on it, that I think that this is often something that um, mystifies people, why so concerned about this, this group, that there was such a um, harsh crackdown began in um, the late 1990s. And I think the Communist Party of China has been quite consistent in feeling that what when it comes to any kind of movement, what worries the most is a movement that, is, that links people up across space and across social groups and also has a kind of clear competing leader or sort of charismatic figure. And Falun Gong had um, all those three things. It was in many parts of the country and there were people of all different social classes that were being drawn to it. So even though the response has always seemed sort of disproportionately um, intense for something that was just um, a fairly quiescent group at that point. I think it fits within a logic of, of control. So that's my thought. To your right. I wanted to thank you for your, uh, your lecture today. Um, I wanted to talk about the, uh, the theft of uh, things like intellectual property, um, the theft of military secrets, where it be reverse engineering. And in my case, uh, back in 2014, I got a letter from the OPM, which is the op uh, Office of Personal Management, that um, my security clearance background information was compromised. And I don't know if either one of you have um, security clearance, but that's some, some extremely sensitive information. And word on the street was that it was taken by the Chinese or the Chinese government. Um, at that time, um, a bunch of my coworkers were just extremely upset that that, was, that that happened. And I think that the administration at that time did virtually nothing other than maybe I think the director of the OPM got to retire or something. Oh, but I got one good thing. I got six months worth of credit monitoring yeah. for that. So I'd just right. like you to I got talk that about too. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, you, this a question is what are we doing about it or how bad is it or just the thoughts about it. Um, so I think the Obama administration actually did do something, and I, I want to say it was 2015, might have been 2016, um, when they basically came to an agreement with the Chinese that the Chinese government would not engage in uh, e cyber, economic cyber theft, right? So Chinese government directed uh, economic espionage. And from everything that I've heard, uh, that actually made a difference. Uh, so companies were uh, being hacked, attacked far less as a result of that agreement. But that is not to say that then they haven't gone after other things. So for example, there, I recently saw a, a notice that said that um, there were about 200 law firms that were being attacked on average 10,000 times a day. Uh, why? Because they had information about mergers and acquisitions that were underway, which is, of course, a very valuable economic information. Um, so, you know, I think there, we just saw the case of Micron Technology uh, this past weekend. Um, so areas where the Chinese feel that they have a deficit in those cutting-edge area technologies, right? So how are the Chinese going to get the Made in China 2025? How are they going to move themselves up the value chain? Well, they have a number of ways to do it. They can acquire uh, companies uh, legally. Uh, they can develop the technology themselves, which will take a long time in some cases, or they can steal it. Uh, and I think they do all three of those things. Um, and I think that is a, an, a significant uh, element of the reason why President Trump is pushing forward with these tariffs, right? Because on average, I think the government has estimated now that 
uh, Chinese steal between 50 and 60 billion dollars worth of IP a year. I think the overall number that I saw out there was 600 billion. I, you know, I don't, it's huge, whatever it is. Um, and so, you know, we're doing these tariffs. I don't think the tariffs are going to make a difference in terms of actually getting at the kind of structural changes that we want in terms of IP theft and forced technology transfer, et cetera. There are other ideas uh, out there. Um, I'll just point to one. I don't want to take up too much. We don't have much time for questions. But one was there was a case with uh, ASMC that did uh, wind power uh, turbine um, technology out of someplace up near Boston. And the Chinese stole the source code for that. And basically, they lost all their business in China. But after that, uh, Ireland and Brazil said they wouldn't let the Chinese company Sinovel invest in their countries uh, if, in fact, the IP theft was proven, right? So one of the things that I've been thinking about is can we forge some kind of international agreement uh, against uh, companies, whether Chinese or any company, right, uh, with intellectual property theft to you know, prevent them from taking advantage of that technology and deploying it elsewhere. So I think it's a huge problem, and um, you know, but I think it's going to require a lot of pushback by many countries, and that's one of the weaknesses of the Trump administration is that we're, you know, basically putting so much stress on our allies that that we're not going to be able to work with them to push pressure on the Chinese. Right here in the middle of the room. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fascinating talk. A quick comment and a quick question. As a uh, college student that was part of the um, Tiananmen Square uh, protest when that was going on, I really hope that uh, Professor Jeff's prediction that the Communist Party would fall would come sooner rather than later. <laughs> <laughs> and the second, uh, my question uh, for Ms. Uh, Economy is, I read your uh, summary when you spoke at the World Affairs Council in Los Angeles, and I was actually in China at that time. You mentioned that there was a um, uprising attempt against uh, Xi from the um, former party leader in the Sichuan province, and I asked my dad about it. Even though he's a member of the CPC, he was not aware of that. So could you... Uh, talk to the audience a little bit about the palace intrigue, because that's always <laughs> fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, I wish I could tell you more about the palace intrigue. The only thing I know about it is that a senior official uh, in the Communist Party, I want to say it was in um, October, November of last year, said that Sun Zheng Tsai, uh, who is one of the people that was potentially going to be uh, an heir apparent to Xi Jinping, uh, he was arrested on corruption, but then this official said, uh, that it was uh, not simply corruption, uh, that he was involved in a coup attempt uh, against uh, Xi Jinping. So that's the only thing that I know about it, was what this one official said. But he said it publicly, and it was, you know, reported. It wasn't some kind of hidden commentary that I heard. It was in, actually, the, in the press. Thank you, Liz. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Please give our panel a round of applause.